when we exalt the name of Jesus, when we humble ourselves and exalt His name, then He lifts us up. Here's a great thought based on that last chorus. So many people are afraid of the dark. Has it ever occurred to you, the dark is afraid of Jesus? Amen. Praise the Lord in this house. Magnify His name. Praise God, praise God, praise God. We've already welcomed all the campuses and the online campus, but I've got a special favor. I got an email from a, a brother that lives in the Philippines and he watches us on the extended campus every week. So I want you all just to say, hi, Bruce. Will you say it real loud? In the Philippines, amen. Give him a big hand. Come on. Why not? Why not? We have more than 500 youth and leaders that are away at camp, at Camp FCY this weekend at Carolina, at Carolina Point, and we wanna pray for them. And let's also pray, take a moment, and intercede for those that may be in the path of this storm. We're not sure where it's gonna to come to shore, but let's just pray and, and believe God for safety and help, and particularly pray for the first responders. Will you do that? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our young people and for those who have made a sacrifice on this weekend, this Labor Day weekend, to be with them and to encourage and teach them and be leaders with them. Bless them, return them all to us safely, re restored, renewed, refreshed, and with a great sense of the purpose and destiny for their young lives. We believe you for it. And God, we pray that you will be in the, in the path of this storm of presence God, that you will surround people, give them peace and safety and that you will hold back the waters and that you will guide and lead them to places of high ground as you do in all of our lives. God, we pray for the first responders particularly, not only that they will be courageous, but that they will be safe, that you will keep them from harm in every way. We believe you for it, God, that in every storm, you're always there with your healing love. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Praise God. Now, before you're seated, before you're seated, I want you to turn and look somebody right in the eye and with all sincerity, I want you to look them right in the eye and say, you look like you've lost weight. I am so delighted to be here this morning. It's great to be back at Free Chapel, and I am. Oh, thank you. And uh, I'm very, very grateful to Pastor Jensen for inviting me to be here this Sunday, particularly. This is the national uh, premiere of my newest book, which is called Courage to Be Healed. I can't think of any place in the whole world that I would rather make that first national appearance than right here at Free Chapel. This is the book, Courage to Be Healed. Uh, it is about uh, inner healing, about the healing of damaged emotions, those things which have wounded us and those that make us toxic in our own lives and the lives of those that are around us. And I hope that it will be a tremendous encouragement to you. The initial response has been phenomenal. The foreword is by John Bevere, a friend of mine, and I, I hope that the book will be a great, great encouragement to you. I wanna speak on the, the line of the book. I'm obviously not gonna lecture from the book, that would be tedious, but I want to give you some thoughts on inner healing uh, this morning. And I hope it'll be useful to you, and I hope you'll get the book. Just a couple of things. I, I signed books after the first service until I was nearly late to the second service. But you buy books, I'll sign them. Somebody asked me if my hand ever gets tired of signing books. Never. You buy a thousand, I'll sign them all. My hand gets tired of signing checks. Um, <laughs> sometimes it'll just cramp up or can't hold a pen. Probably doesn't matter to you to hear this. It matters to me to say it. I do not take one penny from any book or product I've ever sold worldwide, royalties, anything. It all goes to the Foreign Missions Program at Global Servants. So. so I hope you will go out to the book table and spend yourself into bankruptcy. 
If you have your Bibles, if you'll take those and turn, if you will, please, to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. I'm going to begin reading at verse 17. Luke chapter 5. It's a very familiar story. I expect everybody in the room has read it or heard it. Luke chapter 5 and verse 17. And it came to pass on a certain day as he, that is Jesus, of course. And it came to pass on a certain day as Jesus was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by. Now, please just look at what it says about the nature of the, of the congregation, the house, who had gathered that day. It's a very specific description of the clientele there to listen. Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which will come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men taken... Uh, behold, men brought in a, in a bed a man which was taken with the palsy, and they sought means to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch. We read couch there in English translation. It probably just means a blanket, a bedroll, something like that, with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, Jesus said unto him, man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason saying, who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins, but God alone. But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answering said unto them, what reason ye in your hearts, whether it is easier to say thy sins be forgiven thee or to say, rise up and walk. But, ye that, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. And here he spoke to the sick of the palsy. I say unto thee, arise, take up thy couch and go into thine house. And immediately he rose up before them and took up that whereon he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. Put your hands on your Bible, if you will, and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are not gathered here in our numbers to hear the opinions of men. Come Holy Spirit, deal with us, speak to us, brush aside all of our carefully constructed mechanisms of self-defense, wherewith we have fought off the Holy Spirit, some of us for years. Rush in, kick open the doors, Go into the innermost chambers of our hearts and deal with us, speak to us in that recalcitrant heart, that reluctant one who prefers not to hear from you. Speak anyway, O oh Lord. We're not asking you to make it easy. We're asking you to make it real. That when we leave here today, we will say one to another, now surely the Lord has spoken unto us. In the mighty name, Jesus, the strong son of God. Amen. Amen. Have you ever read a passage of scripture that you've read perhaps dozens of times, hundreds of times, that you almost think you can quote, and then suddenly one day you read it and you think, they changed this. <laughs> I had that same experience uh, not too long ago with this passage from Luke chapter 5. It was not that I had read it wrongly, it was that I had read it incomplete. There is one word that somehow or another, all through the years, I had missed. It speaks of the crowd that gathered to hear Jesus. Pharisees and doctors of the law, his most sophisticated and adversarial audience, have packed the house. And then it says, and the power of God was present to heal is the way I've always read it. And that's not what it says. It says, and the power of God was present to heal them. The power of God was present to heal them. The only thing is, none of them got healed. Because they were judging his ministry. They were measuring his ministry. They were analyzing. They were holding him under the, the blinding glare of their spotlight of analysis. The only person that got healed was not even in the room. 
The power of God was present to heal them, but none of them got healed. So the story is of this man. He is so infirm, crippled if you will, that four of his friends take him up, drag him up onto the roof of a house, pull away the tiling, tie ropes around the four corners of his bed or bedroll or his, uh, or his little uh, blanket or whatever it was, and lower him into the middle of the room, into the presence of Jesus for Jesus to heal him. Like you, I'm sure, I've heard dozens of sermons on that passage and I've preached them. I always find that those sermons deal with two things. One is the faith of the men who lower him into Jesus' presence. And that is, a, that is an important point. Faith is a variable in all healing. It is a variable in all healing. The other thing that we always hear about is the supernatural power of Jesus to heal. That goes without saying. But I am absolutely convinced at this stage of my life that there is a variable in healing, particularly in inner healing in the healing of our wounded and damaged emotions. There is another variable beyond faith which we, which we can see in the story and which we must consider. And that variable is courage. At some point, those four men tied the rope around that man's bed, chip away the ceiling. They're going to lower him down into that room and they turn to him. They must have and said, okay, are you ready? It seems to me that he would have been well within his rights to say, no, I'm not doing this. Why? Because think of the risk. A, what if they drop him? I don't think he's a lot better off. (laughs) Furthermore, there's the crowd. We know who is there. Pharisees and doctors of the law. What if they all just begin to laugh and mock him? He has spent his whole life trying to remain out of the public eye. He just wants to lay over in the corner on his blanket until somebody brings him his porridge and he, he's not, he doesn't want children pointing at him. Mommy, what's wrong with him? He doesn't want the Pharisees and the doctors of the law pointing at him and saying, what sin did he commit that God has judged him and done this to him? The second risk he is, is this, we know the story. But remember, he hadn't read Luke chapter five. He doesn't know what Jesus is going to do. We know Jesus healed him. But what if he lowers him? What if they lower him down into the midst of the thing and right in the middle of Jesus' sermon, teaching the, the best and brightest religious minds of the whole country, and they lower this person down into the middle of the room. What if Jesus says, get that thing out of here? What's the matter with you? I don't want that cripple in the middle of my sermon. Yet another rejection. So what does it take for him? What did it take for him? The faith of his friends is there and is celebrated. But for him, it took courage. There's that moment where they say, okay, are you ready? And he said, I'm ready. Let's do it. Every one of us in this room and everyone who will ever see this message, we are all getting well from something. Life is full of hard knocks. Everybody gets cut or nicked or wounded along the pathway and everybody needs healing. The challenge is that it takes courage to allow the Holy Spirit to hold that mirror up and see that that your brother-in-law may not be the problem. It takes guts to see what is wrong with me, what in me needs to happen. If everybody in your family is at odds with you, the only constant amidst all those variables is you. This lady sat in my office for counseling. She was so angry when she came in the door, she could hardly talk. She said, I've been married five times and all five of them were alcoholics, total alcoholics, all five of them. Oh God, she said, I hate men. I hate men. They're just such pigs. They're such swine. I hate all men. And I I was thinking, lady, you've only been in my office five minutes. I feel like I could use a drink. (laughs) At some point or another, at some point or another, we have to find, can I use this in nice, sophisticated Sunday morning service? At some point or another, we have to find the guts to look on the inside. 
to see what in me needs to be changed. Now, the second thing is this, and this was another variable in the whole story that I never, it took me 50 years of ministry and counseling to, to see, and it's this. It's a hard thing to say. Not everybody wants you healed. It's a terrible thing to face. There are some people that actually want you to be in the condition you're in. It may be because your infirmity makes them feel better about themselves. At least I have my problems. At least I'm not the guy on the rooftop. Sometimes it affirms their misbegotten theology because there are some people who see that God is vexing and wounding and hurting people and they, and they like to see that an angry and judgmental God is taking it out on sinful humanity. The Pharisees in that room did not want that man healed. They cherished the theology that whenever there were things wrong in people, it was because God was punishing them. Do you remember the story of the woman who came behind Jesus and touched the hem of his garment? She, what she did in order to get healed was actually to break the law. Under the Jewish law at that time, a woman who was having her period should stay in her house because she might, if she went in the street, accidentally brush up against a male and make him ceremonially unclean. So she not only goes into the street, she not only touches a male, she does it intentionally. She not only touches a male, she touches a rabbi. She not only touches a rabbi, it's the most celebrated and, and controversial rabbi of the, whole, of the whole nation because she believes that there is power in him to heal her. So she sneaks behind him, touches the hem of his garment and gets healed and then sneaks back into the crowd and hides. Why? Because she believes in the power of God to heal her, she is not convinced of the goodness of God to heal her. In other words, she's actually going to steal a healing from Jesus. So Jesus stops and says, somebody touched me. His disciples mock him. They say, Lord, sayest thou somebody touched me? The crowd do multi and the throng do multiply against thee. They, they, they touch you. They're pulling against you all the time. And Jesus says, no, that's just accidental contact. Somebody touched me for I felt virtue, the goodness of his love flow out. Not just power, virtue. I felt virtue flow out from me into a point of human need. And it says the woman, realizing she should not be hid, came and confessed for what cause she had touched him. Oh, she says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I touched you. This is what was happening, and I got healed. And Jesus says to her, be of good comfort, daughter. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Now, if you put the emphasis all on faith, you miss the point. If you, if you put the emphasis on the wrong syllable, any word sounds funny. So if you say thy faith hath made thee whole, you make faith the only variable. Well, what he says is, look, your faith made you whole. Your faith to touch me. If a legalistic and angry God who cared more about law than people was real, when she touched God and broke the law, she would have died. If she had been killed when she touched Jesus breaking the law, the Pharisees would have said, now we're talking Messiah. <laughs> because the Pharisees and the doctors of the law care more about their rules and regulations of healing. And I want to say this to you, Jesus wants you healed. <laughs> now, I want, to, I want to show you something from the book, just briefly. I, I have come to believe that there are all kinds of streams, just poisonous streams that flow out of people's lives. They poison marriages, they poison relationships, they poison our lives, and they poison the lives of those around us. And I, I've come to believe that basically all of those fall into one of about five categories. So here are the five toxic rivers that flow out of people's lives. 
Shame, unforgiveness, rejection, condemnation, and fear. We're just going to leave it up there for a moment. Shame, unforgiveness, rejection, condemnation, and fear. Those five toxics, basically everything that goes wrong in us emotionally is because of one of those toxic rivers. Now, each of those rivers flows out of what I call a throne. You might call it a dominion or a, or a power or a stronghold, but I say a throne. You remember in the book of Ezekiel, the river of life flows out from underneath the altar. I believe these toxic rivers of death flow out, each of them flows out from underneath a presiding throne. And here are those five. Shame depends on, derives its power from deception. Every time shame has hold of a life, it is because some lie or lies have been believed. When, when we believe and tap into those lies, shame has the power over us. I, I'll give you one example from the book. A very high powered executive, a businessman, who came at the peak of his career to a very toxic place in life, depression, anger, marital problems, all of those things is just struggling. He's coming unraveled. And finally, at a crisis in his marriage, he goes for counseling. And in that counseling session, as he gets closer and closer and closer to the truth, he becomes more and more resistant and explosive until finally the real source of shame is uncorked and out comes the reality that he is hidden and suppressed and repressed for 40 years. That when he was 14, he was very violently raped. Why did he suppress it and what is the lie that he believed? The lie he believed is only women can be raped. So if he was raped, then what does it say about who he is as a person? So he spends the next 40 years building this outward exterior of toxic masculinity, anger and combativeness and argumentativeness and ruthlessness in business, trying to earn more and learn more and accomplish more to prove that that couldn't have happened to him until it almost disappears. The problem is the abscess is under the skin and it keeps bubbling out. That shame and that lie just keeps bubbling toxicity out from him. And until it flows out through basically through his whole life. Shame always rests in a lie of some kind or another or a multiplicity of lies. Now I'm not going to, this is not a sermon really about shame. I just want to say this in passing. Now listen to me. If shame is the toxic river in your life and the throne is a lie, then you need to hear the therapeutic reality that undoes it. And that is truth. You cannot be ashamed because of what anybody else did. That's not your shame. That's their shame. That's not on you. That's on them. So here are the therapies. Each one of those is the therapy for that. So truth is the, is the therapeutic reality that undoes the lie. I wonder if you know what is on the wall of the lobby of the Central Intelligence Agency. It says... You shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. I'm not saying anybody in that building believes that. I'm just saying it's on the wall of the lobby. <laughs> now I want to put that grid back up again and I want to just show you each of the five therapies. Unforgiveness, which actually rests in an exalted sense of judgment. It says, I judge others better than God does. God may want them forgiven, but I'm, I'm the Lord, the dark Lord of justice. And that has to come through grace. Rejection rests in doubt. I feel rejected by what others do and therefore it makes me doubt who God is. When I can come to trust him, then I can be healed of that. I can come to understand no one dares to e reject the person whom God has accepted. Ephesians chapter one, I'm accepted in the beloved. So you see that each of these biblical therapies tears down a throne from which flows a toxin. Now let me just deal with two more real quickly. Condemnation rests in a throne which may surprise you. And it's idolatry. Self-idolatry. Do you ever condemnate? Unforgiveness is what we extend toward others. Condemnation is what we receive on ourselves. So why does that rest in idolatry? 
Did you ever hear anybody say this? If you ever said it, I hope you'll never say it again. And that is, I know God has forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. Have you ever heard that? Well, I have, I have a word for you. And I know it sounds harsh, but please listen to me. And it's this. Who do you think you are? Are you a better, more righteous judge than God Almighty? If God says... There is therefore now no condemnation and you allow condemnation to remain on you. It is because you have put self-idolatry on the throne. And the only thing that can pull that down, I just want you to look at this grid again. The only thing that can pull that down is worship. And not just, not just worship in church, but the adoration of putting God back on the throne of my life and not my own judgmental self. We quote this passage all the time, judge not that ye be not judged. But we think it means if I won't judge you, God won't judge me. That's not all that it means. It means if I won't judge myself, God is not judging me. Therefore, there is no judgment. And therefore, worship pulls down the throne of idolatry, which stops the toxic flow of condemnation. Fear is an interesting one. I'll just tell you one quick counseling case on that one. I spent nearly a year counseling with an elderly lady in Orlando who suffered from agoraphobia. Agora from the Latin word for the marketplace. Uh, she was afraid to go outside, especially into crowded places, a shopping mall. Finally, it became so bad she couldn't go in her own front yard. Her grown children had to bring her groceries and care for her in her house. And I began counseling with her by trying to convince her that nothing bad would happen to her in the shopping mall. And we got nowhere. So I decided to reverse field and I began telling her all the bad stuff that could happen to her in her house. <laughs> I begin to say, I, I know you think you're safe in your house, but what if somebody broke in? This is not a particularly great neighborhood. What if somebody broke in here and killed you in your house? She said, Dr. Ullman, I don't, I don't feel like this is helping. <laughs> but I began to work with her because all all fear, the toxic fear, is all rests in pain. The throne that holds fear in place is pain. It may be pain in the past or imagined pain in the future. Did you ever take a child to the doctor and the nurse appears with a hypodermic needle and your kid wigs out? That's because they are projecting a magnified pain that hasn't even happened on them. And therefore the fear takes hold in their life. It can be from the past. Scientists, psychologists tell us we can remember that something hurt. We cannot actually remember the sensation of it. We can't actually remember the feeling of the pain. We only remember that it hurt. Therefore, we tend to do the same thing about the past. We project a magnified pain on the past. So therefore the fear of it being repeated controls my life or the fear of pain I've never seen controls my life. Therefore, look at the, look at the grid one more time. What is the therapy that tears down pain? When I began to talk with that elderly lady about all the bad stuff that could happen, I said, you're no more guaranteed painlessness in your house than you are at the shopping mall. What's the answer? The love of Jesus in the situation, no matter what. Nobody is promised a pain-free life. That's not a biblical promise. What we are promised is that no matter what pain you're going through, Christ will be there and he is perfect love and perfect love casts out all fear. What God wants is to go back in and pull everything out. Get it all out on the table and deal with it. Now, how does, how does that happen? Look, I hear so much or some, let me say that, I hear some derision inside the evangelical world and particularly inside the spirit-filled world toward Christian counseling. I've even heard people say there's no such thing as Christian counseling. Everything that you need, if anything you need, just come to the altar and God will do it. You don't need counseling. I hear angry Pentecostal evangelists on the TV railing on counseling. You don't need counseling. Counseling's of the devil. I always think the same thing when I hear that. You need counseling. 
Anybody that angry on TV needs counseling. Now, why, why am I even mentioning this? And it is this. When we pray for healing, physical healing, when we come forward to the altar, according to James chapter five and pray, somebody, a human, a human being, Jesus is our healer, but a human being anoints us with oil and lays hands on us and prays for us. If Jesus is our healer and he uses the physical hands of someone here, Jesus is also called in scripture, the wonderful counselor then why couldn't he use a counselor flowing in the works, in the gifts of 1 Corinthians 12 to heal us? Look, it's the fact that you go through counseling doesn't necessarily, I, I went through counseling. I said that to a group of ministers one time. I went through counseling and there was an audible gasp in the room. I heard him. <gasps> Afterward, a man came up to me and said, why did you go to counseling? I said, because I needed it. <laughs> Look, everybody from time to time just needs somebody to help them get the gunk out of the gears. So then the, the sort of the final objection is that Jesus never did this. I hear somebody say, Jesus never does inner healing. Well, yes, he does. He did. The passage with which we began this service, that man is lowered into the presence of Jesus. Everybody in the room, the guys on the rooftop, and probably even the man in the bed, are only thinking about physical healing. But Jesus sees that there's an inner issue. Not every person who is infirm, but this man cannot receive and sustain a physical healing until he is healed inside of a spiritual issue, which is condemnation. So Jesus says to the man, everybody's thinking of the outward, of the physical. And Jesus says, be of good comfort. Your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees say, what blasphemy. What blasphemy that he is forgiving sins? Who does he think he is? Only God can forgive sins. Actually, they themselves are in that moment affirming the divinity of Christ. But he says, just so that you know I have the authority to forgive sins, which one, listen, he doesn't say which one is easier to do. He says, which one is easier to say? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or rise up and be healed? But just so that you know I have the power to say and effectuate forgiveness, I will say and effectuate healing, stand up and be healed. And the man is healed, but he does that in order to affirm the inner healing that the man has already received. There's another one though, and I want to close with this one. It's actually a richer look at Jesus doing inner healing counseling. John chapter 21. Following the arrest, death, crucifixion, and burial of Jesus and his resurrection, the disciples are in a pretty bad shape. They're wounded. Their emotions are wounded. They've been disillusioned, disappointed. They thought Jesus was the stairway to the stars. And all they got was an elevator shaft. He's dead. They're confused. Some people say they've seen him. They're just all messed up. Furthermore, their own culture, their church, their little church, only had 12 members in their church. One of them's committed suicide and the other one turned out to be a fraud. That's a pretty rough day at church. <laughs> Judas has hanged himself and Simon Peter, who was the big bold guy, the top man, he denied Jesus three times at Caiaphas' house and the third time with a curse. They're pretty disappointed with Peter. He's ashamed. He's under condemnation. Judas is dead. And Peter says, I'm just going back to Galilee and go back to fishing. They said, we're coming with you. They go out in the boat, they fish all night and they take nothing. The next morning they look over on the shore and there's a man who says, cast the net on the right side and you'll catch. They do that and when they pull the nets up, it's so bulging with fish. What does Jesus do? He is recreating, taking them back to the first time they encountered him. And in the midst of that memory, John, not Peter, Peter is a great guy, but not very perceptive. And John says, 
That's Jesus. Peter then does a remarkable thing. He jumps in the lake. <laughs> Do you know the other disciples said, well, why? We can put part of it down to his impetuosity. Jesus, uh, Peter was just an impetuous man, but there's more. And that is he's going to shore and he knows he's going to take a tongue lashing. Now, uh, nowadays in school, nobody's afraid of being sent to the principal's office, but I'm old. When I was a child, I got sent to the principal's office. I knew what was going to happen. They were going to whoop me. This group, you're so young and modern. And so you don't even know what the word whoop means. I'm not talking about spanking. I'm talking about whoop me. And furthermore, I knew when I got home, I was going to get another whooping. When I got sent to the principal's office for a whooping, I did not want my friends to come along and watch. Peter dives in and swims to shore because he knows what Jesus is going to do. When he comes up there, Jesus is going to say, you, you craven, gutless little coward. I told you you'd deny me. And what'd you say? Oh no, I won't, I won't. You denied me three times and the third time you cursed. So I heard you, I saw you. So just sit over there on a rock. Everybody else gets breakfast, but not you. <laughs> Peter comes up out of the lake. He's dripping. There's nothing in the world colder than lake water at dawn. He's dripping with lake water. He comes up out and Jesus is sitting there in front of a charcoal fire. And Peter comes forward. It's involuntary. You can't help yourself, I promise. You come in from a cold winter night and you go into a room where there's a fireplace, you cannot stop yourself. You go forward, unless it's a really cold night. And it, but <laughs> Peter comes forward to put his hands over that charcoal fire and looks straight into the eyes of Jesus. There's only one other place in the entire New Testament where a charcoal fire is mentioned. It is in Caiaphas' courtyard the night that Peter betrayed Jesus. It says he warmed his hands over a charcoal fire, denied Jesus three times. At the third time, the cock crowed and Jesus walked across the courtyard in chains and their eyes met. The last time they encountered each other, their eyes met over a charcoal fire. Now the second charcoal fire in the entire New Testament is mentioned. Peter comes forward from the lake, puts his hands over that charcoal fire and meets the eyes of Jesus. Jesus takes him right back to the moment of his darkest pain. Peter then thinks of all the things he's supposed to say. I'm sorry, please forgive me. Have mercy on me. I didn't mean to do it. All of that. Before he can open his mouth, Jesus says, let's have breakfast. Let's have breakfast. Then not only that, not only does he bring him back, he asks him three times, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my lambs. Yes, Lord, do you, I, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my sheep. Why three times? Do you know Jesus? Never heard of him. Do you know Jesus? Never heard of him. Do you know Jesus? Never heard of him. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? He recreates, takes him back to the moment of failure, not to hurt him, not to wound him, not to wallow in it, but that he might be healed. Not only does Jesus heal him, he restores him to ministry and leadership. He says now, do what you were called to do in the first place. All of that's over with. Well, let me finish with this. I, I came across a survey a few years ago. The most amazing thing I ever read. Some women's magazine sent out a survey to all of its readers saying, what do you love to hear said to you more than anything else in the world? What's the phrase that you most like to hear? They got thousands and thousands of responses from men and women everywhere. And they took them all, collated them, and came up with the top three answers. But the thing that an American most wants to hear somebody say to them. I guessed number one, and I bet you can guess it. The number one thing an American wants somebody else to say to them. I love you. We love it. I love you. I guessed. I said, I thought so. The second one shocked me. Do you know what it was? I forgive you. 
We are living under a load of guilt and condemnation and we don't know what to do with it. You know what I think? I think you could stand on a street corner in downtown Atlanta and as people walk by, just say, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you. I think people would stop and say, gee, thanks, man, I'll never do it again. <laughs> I love you and I forgive you. The third one handed me a laugh. Do you know what it was? The third most popular phrase Americans want to hear, supper's ready. <laughs> When I read that, I did just what you did. I laughed. And while I was laughing, it hit me. That's the whole law and the prophets. That's the whole thing. That's the whole gospel. That's everything. That's Holy Communion. Every time a pastor anywhere in the world stands behind that sacred table and administers the elements, he says to a wounded people in need of healing, Thus saith the Lord, I love you, I forgive you. Come and dine, the master calleth, come and dine. What a wonderful God. What a wonderful God. Well, let me pray with you. I'm, I'm not gonna give an altar call this morning. It's just a sermon that people need to work with. And I don't want to give an altar call, but I want to pray for you. If you bow your head and close your eyes all over the house, please. If you would just say, Dr. Mark, will you please pray for me? I, I've got some gunk in the gears. I'm tired of blaming everything on everybody else in my family. I've got some stuff and I need to be healed. Will you pray for me? If that's you, then just lift your hand up and take it right back down. Oh, oh, hundreds all over the room. So many, so many, so many. You know, the one thing that proves, that doesn't prove how sinful you are, how evil you are or anything else. You know, the one thing it proves, how courageous you are. You have the courage to be healed. Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you that you're going to begin a new work in us. Take us further, deeper, more healed than we've ever been. Grant us courage to be healed, O oh Lord. We believe you in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand? We're going to sing a beautiful little chorus. We're going to sing, a, I'm no longer a slave to fear, but put in any word you need to. No longer a slave to fear. I'm no longer a slave to condemnation or unforgiveness or rejection. And let's just sing this a couple of times through. Come on. Because I'm no longer a slave. give you a closing blessing and then I'm going to beat a hot path around there and meet you at the book table. Look right up here. Now by the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the sweet communion and fellowship of the Holy Ghost keep you in perfect peace and in divine healing until the day that he appears. God bless you. God bless Free Chapel. I'm no longer Cause I'm no longer A slave to fear I am a child of God I want to remind every single one of you That may be in the path 
uh, of uh, Hurricane Dorian that we're praying for you. We're praying that God's hand of protection continues to keep you safe, not only today, but throughout the remainder of this week. If you could, let us know how we can pray for you specifically as you enter into this brand new week. And we have a team here that's happy to pray with you and see God move in your life. But not only that, for all the ladies out there, if you have not already picked up your ticket for Divine Conference coming up in just a few short weeks, make sure you go to divineconference.org, register, get yourself a ticket, as well as make sure you get a ticket for somebody else that would need to be encouraged and uplifted during this incredible weekend. Again, go to divineconference.org, get your tickets today, because we know that thousands of women are going to be impacted and changed by all that's taking place on that amazing weekend. But we love you so much. Thanks again for joining us here today. And we'll see you next Sunday morning.